Alright, chapter 7 has to do with periodic properties. In this chapter, you will find out why we call periodic table the elements the periodic table. Right? If something happens periodically, what does that mean? Not all the time, but it comes at predictable intervals, right? Periodically, like the seasons are periodic, winter, spring, summer, or fall. Well, that's the reason we call it the periodic table, is because these trends are periodic and predictable. All right, so the trends we're going to think about. We're going to think about sizes of atoms, which we're going to talk a little bit about, right? N equals value. We also looked at ions in terms of how they change size. Ionization energy, that's a good term. Scientists actually use a very understandable term in this case. Ionization energy has to do with what? what? What could we define it as since it's such a nice predictable term? Not tendency, but... Here is... If we looked at ionization energy happening, um, we could say here's an example of what happens during what we might use as ionization energy. What is this? What's going on here? Not dissociation. Dissociation happens with ionic substances when you put them in water. This is not necessarily dissociation. What is this? This is radox stuff, right? So you're losing and gaining electrons, right? So in this case, we talk about metals have what we call ionization energy. Ionization energy is the amount of energy it takes to remove an electron from a mole of gaseous atom. So we have to standardize the electron way. We say, okay. Let's go to cost you different amounts of solid liquid gas, right? So we're going to gasify everything. Once we gasify it, how much energy does it take to remove the electrons from one mole of those pieces? So what do you suppose the units of ionization energy are generally going to be in? Kilojoules per mole, right? We've got to quantify it for how many pieces that you have. All right, the next thing we're going to be talking about in this chapter is... Um, What's called electronegativity or electron affinity. Okay, electron affinity is this particular thing happening. So we take chlorine atom plus an electron and make chloride ion. So nonmetals we describe as having electron affinity. Also known as electronegativity. And it has to do with how willing a particular element is to grab, or how likely it is to grab the electrons of other elements. So we've got ionization energy when we're talking about metals, we have electron affinity when we're talking about nonmetals. Mendeleev was the one that developed the periodic table, and he put them in these groups. Um, he started with about two or three dozen and then made predictions as to where elements were going to be based on their chemical and physical properties. The rows and the columns give you different information about the chemical and physical properties of each of the elements on the periodic table. If we look at the rows versus the columns, rows are in this direction here. Those are rows, also known as periods. So that's the horizontal orientation, rows or periods. These are groups or families. And those are listed as the columns. Now, the rows, remember, correspond to the N value, the principal quantum number. The columns can correspond to the type of spin that elements in that particular group exhibit, right? The SPD or F type of spin. 
This idea of effective nuclear charge is plotted on two different graphs here. This is the first graphic at the top here, the one with the concentric circles. This is supposed to look like if you took, like they do with trees, when they're looking at the tree roots to see how old the tree is, and they cut it in half, and then they count how many rings there are. That would be as if you cut an atom in half. And in this particular case, they're looking at an atom of neon. And that's why the atom of neon is an isotope. It has 11 protons in the nucleus. That's what the plus 11 is in the middle of the circle. In the outer circle, you'll see that there's 10 negative charges, 10 electrons, in a normal isotope of neon. If you look at that top graphic, then the bottom graphic is represented in terms of electron density using that same information. If we look at this bottom graphic, this is the distance from the nucleus along the horizontal axis. So distance from the nucleus, and they're using the astronomer's notations here, angstrom. To us as chemists, we would probably call that nanometers, right? So we're looking at a linear distance, a very small mini linear distance from the nucleus. So there's right smack dab next to the nucleus. And as you get further and further out, the density of the electrons changes. And so here's the density along the vertical axis. So here's right next to the nucleus as you move further and further away from the nucleus. And here's how many electrons are in there at, based on this idea of density. As you look right next to the nucleus, there's two large jumps in the density of electrons. And that's because neon is in what row on the periodic table? Neon is over here in the second row, so it has how many shells of electrons? It has two shells. There's the electron density of the first shell. There's the electron density of the second shell. So now they're showing you how the electron density changes as you get further and further away from the nucleus. Now, yes? Th that's a good question. Um, the nucleus in this particular case is an isotope of neon. And remember, isotopes are kind of different because they're different ways. So the isotope of All right, so sizes of the atoms tend also to change depending on how you transition between columns versus rows. It makes a lot of sense, this transition, top to bottom within the row, right? That transition makes a lot of sense that the atoms get larger because as you're going from top to bottom in a row, you're adding layers of electrons. So if you looked at the overall change in size as you move from top to bottom, right? The size starts out small. And the atoms get larger as you go top to bottom because you're increasing the number of shells. That trend makes a lot of sense. What doesn't make as much sense is the trend left to right. If you look at sodium and magnesium, which are in the third row, and you continue over to the third row here with aluminum, silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, and argon, it looks as if, as you go left to right, what's happening to the size? It's decreasing as you're going left to right. So in this direction, the size increases. So sizes of the atoms tend to make a trend that looks like this. If I were students in this class on the next exam, I would put this trend on my 3 by 5 card because then you can make comparisons and I might ask you to rank a group of atoms. For example, rank carbon phosphorus, calcium, and iodine from smallest to largest, using this idea of sizes of atoms. All right, calcium and phosphorus, who would be, oh, excuse me, carbon and phosphorus, who would be bigger or smaller than? Carbon would be the smallest, right? And then phosphorus would be bigger than it. All right, what about phosphorus versus calcium? Who's going to be bigger there? Calcium. calcium is going to be bigger, so we'll put calcium here. And finally, calcium versus iodine, who's going to be bigger? Iodine is going to be the biggest. All right, so we would rank them. 
just happened that I chose them as I was looking at the periodic table in the same order. That doesn't necessarily happen all the time. But you can use this for sizes of atoms. Remember, not ions, because ion sizes changes depending on if they're positive or negative ions. Yes? But the, uh, the column is always going to trump the uh, rows. Back and forth. That's a good point to think about. This column always trumps this trend. This is a small trend. This is a huge trend. So the ones bar on the top are always going to be bigger than the ones back and forth. Good question. All right. So that's for sizes of atoms. It changes left to right. But now, why does that happen? That doesn't make as much sense. Top to bottom it makes sense because you're adding rows, but why do the sizes decrease as you go from left to right? Why does this happen? Why does this trend happen? It doesn't make sense. Because look, aren't I adding electrons to the same shell? So say, for example, I'm going across from sodium and magnesium, aluminum, silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, and argon, I'm adding electrons to the same shell. Why are they then getting smaller as I go left to right? Yes? Is it for that same reason? Because it's actually, it's actually starting to become a full shell, which means that's more stable. Well, it is becoming more of a full shell, and hopefully it's becoming more stable, but that's not why the size changes. It's more, who's more attracted to the plastic? The ones on the end. So even though you have more electrons, your nucleus has become more positive. So this has a very small positive nucleus. This is more positive, more positive, more positive, and so on. As you go left to right, so it pulls that same shell and its electrons a little bit tighter. So this is the trend for sizes of atoms, which is different than the trend for sizes of ions. So that works for atoms. But now we have to think about ions. And here I like this graphic because it shows metal ions versus non-metal ions, what happens to them. All right, here's a metal ion. We talk about the parent atom, in this case, being lithium, and the daughter ion being lithium ion. So who's bigger, the parent atom or the daughter ion? The parent is bigger because you're losing electrons, and so the daughter becomes smaller. Now if we're looking at nonmetals, we look at oxygen as the parent atom, and oxide is the daughter ion. So who's bigger in this case? The daughter's bigger because you're gaining electrons. I like this particular animation because it's got a little click button on it that shows us how ion or atoms change into ions and how that changes their size according to their position on the periodic table. And the internet appears to be slow today. Hmm. What do you mean? This worked just fine last week. Let's see. There it goes. There it goes. Whoops. No, nope, that's not what I want. Close that tab. All right, yes, copy and paste, I think, is the best way to do that. All right, now. There it goes. All right. So we've got some elements that they've randomly chosen in different positions on the periodic table. And this is their size as atoms. Remember the first trend we looked at? This is their size and how they change as atoms, which makes sense, right? You go top to bottom in a group, you're adding shells. That's n equals 2 versus n equals 4, n equals 5. you got more shells that's getting bigger. You go left to right across a row. There's lithium, boron, oxygen, and neon. As you go left to right, it's getting smaller. This is the size as atoms. Up at the top, they've taken some other atoms, not necessarily the same ones as in the table. Here they've got the metals and here they've got the non-metals. When I take and I switch this toggle button, I'm going to go from the atoms, what they look like, to the ions. Here we go. All right, I'm switching the toggle button. Now you can see across the top that the metals lose electrons, the non-metals gain. Now they're going to do the same thing with the elements on the periodic table and they go left to right. All right, I'm going to click it back to atom view. 
Let's do it one more time now that you know. They go across the top first, and it goes metals first, and then nonmetals, and then it starts going left to right, metals and nonmetals, as you go across the bottom on the periodic table. So nonmetals lose electrons, they get smaller. Metals, or excuse me, nonmetals gain electrons, they get bigger. Metals lose and get smaller. All right, so you have to look at the incidence and the size of ions on a case-by-case -case basis. You can't necessarily say that um, it's going to follow a particular trend. So you do have to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. All right, so cations are smaller than the parent atoms. Anions are generally bigger than the parent atoms, which brings us to this idea of ionization energy. Now, Ionization energy, the first ionization energy does follow a trend. So let's look at that trend. If I look at first ionization energy, we can call this first ionization energy. We can also call this trend electronegativity. It follows the same trend. So ionization energy. And electronegativity, also known as electron affinity, follows this general trend. So it increases along that axis and increases along that axis. Which, if you think, is the exact opposite of the size of atoms trend. Let's think about that. Size of atoms. Small atoms, which get bigger, top to bottom, right? Why would it cost you? Apparently, it costs more energy to remove an electron from an atom up here than it does from an atom down here, right? Because the ionization energy, the energy it takes to remove an electron from a gaseous state, metal atom, one mole of them, increases. Why would it cost me less energy to remove an electron from one of these, bless you, than up here it's going to cost you more energy to remove an electron from one of these? Why is that true? Mm -hmm. Right, the closer they are to the nucleus, the harder it's going to be to take an electron away, right? You should tell the kids that, right? You're going to the park. You know, there's no one here. I have to see you. If I cannot see you anymore, it's much easier for that guy to take you. Right? So you always, I always have to be able to see you, no matter where you are. So if you can't see him, it's way far away. Here you've got the shielding effect going on, right? All those layers of negatively charged electrons in between the nucleus and the outer shell. They're shielding that positively charged nucleus from electrons on the outside. Same thing holds true here. Now, electronegativity has to do with a chlorine grabbing an electron and becoming a chloride ion. So, electronegativity of something, let's look at the nonmetals that we've got. Right? Electronegativity of something that's a nonmetal is much higher up here, right? Electronegativity is going to be much higher at the top of the column than at the bottom. Why are these more likely to attract electrons than these are? We're talking about nonmetals. Why are these going to attract more electrons? Why are these going to have a higher affinity for electrons? Once again, they're closer to that band of shell, right? That positively charged nucleus doesn't have so many layers <laughs> shielding it. So it can grab electrons of other elements. So you can describe both the trends in ionization energy and electronegativity as following this general trend. So once again, if I ask you to rank the ionization energy of a group of elements or the electronegativity of a group of elements, you could use this trend, but it is a trend in this case for the first ionization energy only, right? If you're talking about subsequent ionization energies, it's a little bit different trend, which is what this slide is all about. The second ionization energy is the energy required to remove the second electron, which is very different than the first, right? 
The first ionization energy trend you can use this graph for. The size of atoms trend you can use this trend for. But once you go to second ionization energy, or once you're talking about ions, then it changes. All right, the second ionization energy has to do with the family, which makes sense. Let's look at something like sodium. What do we know about sodium and sodium's family? The vertical column that is sodium. What do we know about sodium's family? They all have how many valence electrons? How many does sodium's family have? One valence electron, a single valence electron. So if we look at the ionization energy, that's what these values mean at the top along the horizontal axis on the top. I1 is the ionization energy for the first electron. I2 is the amount of energy required to remove the second electron. I3 is the amount of energy required to remove the third electron from that atom. So if we look at sodium, the first one costs about 500 kilojoules per mole, right? 500 kilojoules of energy to zip off an electron from a mole of sodium atoms. The second ionization energy goes up almost 10 times as much. You'd think it might double or triple. Why is that second ionization energy cost you so much? Well, once I take off one electron from sodium, what does it become isoelectric with? Neon. How hard or difficult is it going to be to take an electron off of neon? Much harder than it's going to be to take that single band's electron off sodium, right? So that makes sense that the jump in ionization energies for sodium, would you expect that trend to hold true for the entire family of elements, this first group here? Yes, the big jump in ionization energies for the alkali metals is between the first and the second valence electron because that's when you're removing it from a um, full outer shell. Magnesium. All right, let's look at magnesium on the periodic table. Here's magnesium in group two. So how many valence electrons does magnesium have? Two. All right, let's look at the energies that we use to compare that. The first ionization energy for magnesium is about 700 kilojoules per mole. The second one, as we might expect, about twice as much, right, 1,400 kilojoules per mole. The third one, look at that, holy smokes, it's like eight, seven or eight times as much. Why does it jump so high between the second ionization energy and the third ionization energy for magnesium? Okay, because the first electron, I remove it from magnesium. What does it become isoelectric with when I remove one electron? Sodium, I move that second electron, it becomes isoelectric with Neon, taking that third electron is going to be pretty hard because you're taking it from a valence shell of a noble gas, right, which is stable electrically and does not want to lose that. All right, well, it makes sense here now. Aluminum, low, 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 and the high one comes between the third and the fourth valence electrons, right? Does that make sense? And that's because aluminum has how many? Three, so it would make sense that the big jump comes between. So now this tells you, see this little stair-step line? That stair-step line represents what? The noble gas shell. That's where it begins is in that stair-step line. So, for example, on an exam, if I said, what would you expect the big jump in ionization energies would be for gallium? Between the first and the second, the second and the third, or the third and the fourth valence electron removed for gallium, which is Ga. Between the third and the fourth, because gallium's got three, <coughs> that it will lose fairly easily. That fourth one's going to cost you a lot more energy. All righty. So there's our first ionization energy trend, which we summarized on the trend value that I gave you here, right? This is the first ionization energy trend. Increases and increases, which is directly opposite the size of the atoms trend. It's an easy way to remember it. Here's a graph that we used to have students make a long time ago when I taught high school chemistry. Let's see, I left teaching high school chemistry in 2000. So we didn't even have computers in the classroom yet. So what we would do is we'd give students two, a table of two values. The first value would be atomic number, starting at the number one going up all the way to number one over here. If you look at the periodic table, right, the first value in atomic number on the periodic table 
corresponds to hydrogen is number one, helium is number two, lithium is three, beryllium is four, boron is five, etc., etc., etc. So the first value is just as you go on left to right on the periodic table as they get more complex all the way up to 100 and something. The second value we would give students that corresponded to that atomic number was the actual ionization energy for the first ion or for the first electron that was removed. All right, so we would give them those values and then we would tell them to plot them on a graph. On the horizontal axis was atomic number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, in this case only up to about 55. So we only went up to, let's see, element, what's 55 there? about cesium it looks like so actually we ended at xenon so 54 is xenon number one is what what would this point right here be number one hydrogen all right and amount of ionization energy changes along the vertical axis so that's how much energy it takes to remove the first electron from that element all right so hydrogen is number one helium is number two lithium is number three what would be in the fourth spot here boron and so on and so on. All right, what's at the low points of all of these graphs? Lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium. What group is that on the periodic table? Lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium. It's the first row of elements, the alkali metals. Why are they at the low point of this ionization energy graph? It takes the least because they have how many? Just one. So they're going to give it up pretty easily, right? At the top, what are the, what are the elements at the top? The highest amount of energy. The noble gases. And why are they the most energy? To take an electron from them because they're electrically stable. And you notice you see that helium has the highest ionization energy because it's so itty bitty. Right? Compared to the other noble gases, helium is tiny. So, oh, that nucleus is right next to that valence electron where xenon, the nucleus, is much further away and there's shielding going on between the individual layers. So this is why it's called the periodic table of elements. This would be a great essay question. Why is it called the periodic table of elements? You can say that the trends are periodic if you graph the atomic number versus ionization energy at the low points on this period doesn't this look periodic right it goes up and then down and then up and then down and then up and down and up and down that looks pretty periodic to me right all right so it starts at a low point which is the alkali metals you go across the row it goes to a high point low point alkali metals high point noble gases they are the trends are periodic. Is that now makes total sense, right? That they would call it the periodic table of the elements. All right, we already talked about electron affinity. Electron affinity is the same trend that we talked about here, right? Same trend. Electron affinity has ionization energy, but remember when we're talking about ionization energy, we're only talking about metals. Electron affinity we used to describe the non-metals. Now we're going to make sure. And even though the trends are the same, we're generally talking about two different types of elements that have specific physical and chemical characteristics. Here's a summary of their physical and chemical characteristics. Um, outside the room 219 here, there's a periodic table. It has pictures of what stuff looks like at room temperature. And you'll see on one side of the periodic table, right, all the metals. Everything on this side of the periodic table is all kind of gray and shiny. They look like metals, except my favorite, which is copper, which is kind of warm colored, right? Everything on this side of the periodic table is generally liquids or gases, and so it's going to look very different than the gray, shiny stuff that metals do. Metals conduct electricity very well because their electrons are held very loosely, right? They, they only have a few valence electrons that they want to get rid of, and all that electricity is is moving electrons. So if you've got some loose electrons already in the structure of a metal, moving electricity through it is no big deal because the electrons are already loose. Nonmetals, not so much, right? It's difficult to conduct electricity with nonmetals because they hold their electrons tightly. And if an extra one comes zipping through, they're going to want to grab it. They're not going to want to pass it to some guy around them. 
Um, if you take a metal and you hit it with a hammer, it's going to bend. It's malleable and flexible and ductile. You hit a non-metal with a hammer, it's going to shatter into a million pieces, and that's because the way that the bonds are held. Electrons are held loosely in not metals. Non-metals hold their electrons very tightly, so it shatters rather than bending. Yes? So the non-metals are not malleable. Not at all. Nope. You, break, you shatter a non-metal or you hit a non-metal, if it's in solid form, it's generally going to shatter. Yeah. So if you take, for example, sulfur, if you've ever seen elemental sulfur, it's kind of yellow, crystally looking stuff. If you hit that with a hammer, it would shatter into a whole bunch of smaller crystals. All right. So there's where they are, metals and non-metals, the ions that they tend to form, which we've already talked about. Um, this is a link to a periodic table which shows you what each of the elements looks like at standard temperature and pressure, which is kind of interesting if you're interested in those kind of things. And then we talk about the compounds. Nonmetals, um, there's a good bonding animation about ionic versus molecular bonds, but we've already talked a lot about that. And then, of course, there's the metalloids, which are the fence sitters, and they're the ones that have characteristics of both metals and nonmetals. A perfect example is silicon, right? Silicon is right in the middle, then metals and nonmetals. It's technically on the nonmetal side, but silicon is one of those nonmetals that actually conducts electricity, and it's a darn good thing it does, or we wouldn't be working on this computer right now, and you wouldn't have your phones working very well unless we had some silicon chips, and silicon conduct electricity where carbon cannot. All right, so the trends on the group, the alkali metals, as you go top to bottom, remember that's group 1A, those are the ones that become more and more um, violent when they react, and I believe the animation that shows that is one of these. There are six alkali metals. All right, so I'm going to stop this just for a minute. Whoops, come back here. What? Whether you've left. No, wrong one. There are six this alkali metals. Okay, I'm going to pause it for a minute. And I'm going to turn down the volume because I want to narrate this thing. All right, what they're going to do now is they're going to show you the alkali metals. Lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, and cesium, top to bottom. First, they cut each of the metals. And you can see on the outside, before they cut it, it's kind of gray. And that's because oxidation has taken place. And what is oxidation? Oxidation is the? loss of electrons. So you've lost some electrons and you've created an oxide, which is in this case a lithium oxide on the outside of the metal, which is gray versus the shiny that the metal is. All right, so now I'm going to let them start the video and they'll cut it and you can see underneath the oxide, it's a very shiny piece of lithium. Now the lithium will begin to oxidize immediately after it's cutting it because it's exposed to air. So it is fairly reactive because it has only that one valence electron. So it oxidizes relatively rapidly and that's in real time. You see it begin to oxidize and eventually become the color of the rest of the oxidation outside. So now they scrape it a little bit more so you can see that what's underneath it. Okay, now they're going to take the sodium and they're going to drop a little. Oh, first, they're, no, now this is, excuse me, this is the sodium. First one was the, so, the lithium. This is the sodium. And they showed you in that clip a little bit before this, let me back it up just a bit, that they have to keep it under kerosene. I think that was part of the picture. Okay, there it is. Now, they'll show it briefly being stored as pieces under kerosene because it is so reactive, they have to store it under kerosene so none of the air molecules can touch it. See, there it is, how it's stored under kerosene. Now they're going to take another hunk, and this is now the sodium. Now they're cutting sodium. It looks very similar on the outside. Once they cut the sodium, look how much quicker it oxidizes. Remember the lithium? It was relatively slow. Now this is the potassium. And the potassium oxidizes even quicker, even quicker than the lithium and the sodium. That was the potassium. The elements seem to react more quickly with air. And now they're going to show you the reactivity of them in water. First, they're going to put a little bit of lithium in the water. This is just water. They've taken a tiny little pea-sized piece, and you can see that it's so reactive that it's producing hydrogen gas as it skips around on the surface of the water until all of the lithium is gone. Now they're going to use sodium, and it reacts even quicker and 
changes quicker because it is a little bit bigger of an atom, so it loses those electrons more readily. It has a lower ionization energy. There's the sodium being ionized. Right? So there's the sodium zipping around. It just it stays on the surface of the liquid because it's creating a little uh, hydrogen gas in between it and the water. Now they're going to show you potassium. They drop the potassium in the water, so reactive it creates fire on top of the water. That is just water. That's the potassium that they put on water. Look at little hunks of it are exploding. Now here's the rubidium. As soon as it touches the water, and the last one is the cesium. Here's your here's will be your favorite. This is the cesium. You can see that things gradually become more terrifying as we go down the group. Let's try cesium. Our fifth alkali metal. No, here's the cesium. Sorry, that was the last one. This is the cesium. Right. Okay. So pretty exciting, right? And why does it happen that it happens as you go top to bottom? Not so reactive, more reactive, more, more, all the way to season, which is uber reactive. Why are they so much more reactive top to bottom? What happens to the size of the atoms top to bottom in that same group? Size increases. So how much easier is it to pull an electron and oxidize that element? Easier as you go t down the bottom, right? The top ones, the small ones, it's going to be very difficult to remove an electron from comparison to the ones at the bottom. Right, here's my new story for the application portion of this, the humanism portion. When I was in grad school, that's what John recorded for this. When I was in grad school at NAU, the grad students, we were allowed.